Tonight, a mysterious twist in the death investigation of a government whistleblower. His body found in Amador County. His death first believed to be suicide, but now investigators are backtracking. CBS 13's Rick Boone with what detectives are now saying. 66 year old Philip Haney, a former DHS officer, was known in DC circles as a person who never held back his opinions, even about his boss, President Barack Obama. I was told to remove all unauthorized references to terrorism. Testifying to Congress as a whistleblower about Obama, claiming that the then president was not taking the threat of terrorism seriously. I would like to just show you now the logo of the Muslim Brotherhood the moderate organization that this administration chose to ally itself with. In 2016, Haney even wrote a book, See Something, Say Nothing, highlighting his concern. We've been inundated with a lot of theories of, of what may have taken place. You know, we're, we're looking at everything. Haney was found dead of a self-inflicted gunshot wound in Amador County over the weekend. Everything we saw on scene is consistent with somebody putting a gun to themselves and pulling the trigger. Now, we're, we're, not, we're not making a statement that this was, in fact, suicide. Previous reports did indicate Haney's death was a suicide, but deputies haven't made that determination as of yet. His body was found in a car in this park and ride that's along Highway 16. It's less than three miles from where he lived in an RV park. Investigators are not saying if foul play was involved. Deputies say it is a standard to analyze these type of incidents before any ruling can be made. Every death that occurs in the county uh, when it comes to something like this, we treat and look at it as a homicide until we prove otherwise. Now the FBI is part of this ongoing investigation and we're told an autopsy will happen very soon. Hello, Amador County. This is Amador County Sheriff Coroner Martin Ryan. I want to talk to you today a little bit about uh, an investigation that we've had ongoing since Friday, February 22nd, concerning the death of a Philip Haney, uh, who at the time of his death was residing in the 49er RV village uh, area in a recreational vehicle. Mr. Haney was found outside of his vehicle in the park and ride lot adjacent to Highway 16 near Highway 124. Uh, a lot of speculation has been made as a result of that. We have issued the limited information that we can release, but I did want to take a chance here to talk to you uh, about what exactly has been going on without specific details. Number one is there's been a lot of speculation that my office uh, came to an immediate conclusion that, that this was in fact a suicide. If you will go back and review that initial press release, uh, it states clearly that it appeared to be a self-inflicted gunshot wound. That is what we do on any of these types of cases. The initial deputies that arrive on scene make an assessment based upon the totality of information and evidence that they see at the scene prior to calling out uh, the investigators to do the follow-up. Uh, that was done in this case as well. Uh, that is the start of an investigation. That is not the end of an investigation. Uh, we continue to move forward with that, along with some assistance uh, from our fellow agencies uh, in this region, not the least of which is the Federal Bureau of Investigation, which is going to be assisting us with the processing of certain evidentiary documents uh, and things like that, uh, the RV, the vehicle that he was in, uh, a number of different things, a laptop, cell phone, uh, some documentation, handwriting, things like that that need to be analyzed. They are assisting our investigation. I want to make this clear. This is an Amador County Sheriff's investigation. We are being assisted by the FBI on the forensic side of things. The other assistance we're getting is uh, a routine one for us when we call for a forensic autopsy. Uh, we utilize the services of the Sacramento County Coroner's Office. Uh, they will be conducting an autopsy in this case as well. It is the role and responsibility of a coroner in the state of California to determine the cause and manner of deaths that occur like this. That is what we're going through now. This is going to be a lengthy process uh, that takes time. It takes time to process evidence. It takes time to analyze uh, the documentation, things like that at the FBI, as well as the autopsy information of what flows from that from the Sacramento County Coroner's Office. So we will keep you updated as we can. We cannot give specifics. Uh, we are being inundated nationally uh, with inquiries into Mr. Haney's death, um, but we are not commenting on that. We cannot. 
Uh, we will not make a final determination on this matter until all of the evidence is analyzed, all the forensics are completed, and our investigation is completed. And it won't be until then that we make that final determination. No determination has been made. No de determination will be made until this is completed. Thank you. Philip Haney studied Arabic language and culture while working as a scientist in the Middle East before becoming a founding member of the Department of Homeland Security in 2002. He first worked as an agriculture officer for Customs and Border Protection, advancing to an armed CBP officer where he served at the National Targeting Center. He was quickly promoted to its advanced targeting team. When he bravely tried to say something about the people and organizations that threaten the nation, his intelligence information was eliminated by DHS officials. These types of records are the basis for the ability to connect the dots. His earlier scientific career in the Middle East as an entomologist, his specialty being the study of ants, contributed to his efforts as an investigator in his career of nearly 15 years at the Department of Homeland Security. It was because of this unique experience that he was drafted into the Department of Homeland Security as a founding member. He says, being an ant specialist, I simply began to follow the trail and I would find the nest. In counterterrorism, you do the same thing. Every day, DHS Customs and Border Protection officers watch many individuals associated with known terrorist affiliations. Then they look for patterns. Haney states, enforcing a political scrubbing of records of Muslims impaired our ability to effectively connect the dots. Philip Haney has deep experience in threat analysis and intelligence. While serving as an officer with Customs and Border Protection, he conducted numerous interviews of individuals with potential links to terrorism. He is credited with many cases and finding over 300 individuals with potential links to terrorism at the National Targeting Center. He saw leaders of the Muslim Brotherhood front groups invited into the highest chambers of power and given access to sensitive information to allow them to shape the nation's security policy. The Department of Homeland Security currently has a national campaign to raise public awareness of terrorism and terrorism-related crime known as, if you see something, say something. However, with these new policies in place, it had effectively become, if you see something, say nothing. Philip Haney is the lead author of See Something, Say Nothing, a best-selling expose of the Obama administration's submission to the goals and policies of the Muslim Brotherhood as well as other Islamic groups operating here in America and around the world. Newly retired, Philip Haney tells his story to the public for the first time in further fulfillment of his oath to support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Haney's insider eyewitness accounts, supported by internal memos and documents, exposes a federal government capitulating to an enemy within and punishing those who reject its narrative. Philip Haney has been a featured guest on scores of television and radio interviews, including recent appearances on Hannity and The Kelly Report. In June of 2016, Haney offered testimony and briefings before members of both the Senate and the House and before the Senate Judiciary Committee. Tonight, the American Freedom Alliance is proud to present Philip Haney with the American Freedom Award for his ongoing efforts in this active campaign against appeasement and public deception tell you about Philip Haney now uh, and this is something that I've never really talked about I've had him on the show before and I've introduced him as a great patriot but uh, you know and then DHS whistleblower etc cetera, etc cetera. but I never went into Philip and what I know about Philip because Philip was a was an important uh, source for not only me but others and uh, my relationship began with Philip t 10 years ago. And uh, he, is, he is a guy who I didn't even want to meet for a while because I just didn't want to know anything about him because I was afraid I would slip and say something and it would put him in danger. Uh, he was probably the number one enemy of the Obama administration, I think, inside uh, the Department of Homeland Security. 
This is the guy who outed the Obama administration for telling DHS to purge everything on the Muslim Brotherhood. Um, this is a guy who, uh, until I check with attorneys, I'm not going to tell you <laughs> uh, all the things that he was involved in with us. Um, but you need to know America lost a, a, a profound patriot. <sighs> Philip was 66 years old. He was one of the founding members of DHS. He loved the Constitution and America. If we had federal employees that had a quarter of his understanding of what this country was, what it meant, and how close we were on, at all times of losing freedoms, we wouldn't be in the situation we're in today. I have been in situations where, with Philip to where he knew they were on to him. And the things that he uh, got for us uh, – It makes me really angry today that we have a whistleblower, Eric Caramella, who everyone on the left is trying to protect, who we know who he is. We know who he is. And they're saying that his life is in danger. And no, it's not. No, it's not. I want Caramella to testify. I want him to speak. He's not in danger. He's in danger from the left. Because his usefulness is over now. And no one ever spoke about Philip Haney. No one. The media ignored him. No one was looking out for him. He's one of the most honorable men I've ever met. I have so wanted to introduce you to him. And tell you about him. For a decade. He has been on this show. But you didn't really meet the Filipini that I knew. A guy who was willing to put himself in danger. A guy who knew what he was dealing with knew that he could be killed or knew that he would be disappeared or knew that he would go to prison. And he was absolutely unafraid. And this is one reason why I know, why I so strongly feel he didn't kill himself. Phil and I sat in my office a few years ago. And we spoke about God. And we spoke about the country. And that few people had the opportunity to do what he did. And that he felt very alone. But he wasn't. The man knew who he was, knew what time it was, and knew who God was. He was a deeply spiritual man and a man who understood history and understood his place in it. No man who speaks like Philip Haney did goes off and kills himself. I'd like to ask the police that found his body and deemed it a suicide if he had a thumb drive around his neck.
I hadn't seen Phil for probably a year, maybe two years. But I'd say hi to him. I'd hug him. And I'd slap him on the chest. He knew what that meant. I was feeling the thumb drive. Because there were documents that he kept around his neck. I only know what a few of them were. Wonder if that thumb drive was found on the body. Who are we turning into America? On November 5th, 2009, at Fort Hood in Texas, an army major named Nadal Hassan gunned down 14 innocent persons, including an unborn child, while shouting Aluha Akbar. Prior to this terror attack, federal officials were aware that Hassan had attempted to contact Al-Qaeda and exchanged numerous emails with the terrorist Anwar al-Awlaki. A self-professing soldier of Allah, Hassan had also worried many colleagues with his promotion of an extreme or radical interpretation of Islam. Yet, for fear of being branded as politically incorrect or otherwise, they did nothing. Then, after the fact, the Obama administration classified these terrorist killings as mere workplace violence and each of you will be sworn in momentarily. And while you're coming forward, I will begin by introducing each of the members of the second panel. The first witness is Dr. M. Zudi Jasser, who is the founder and president of the American Islamic Forum for Democracy in Phoenix, Arizona. A graduate of the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee and the Medical College of Wisconsin, Dr. Jasser is a former commissioner of the United States Commission on International Religious Freedom, and he served as a medical officer in the United States Navy. Dr. Jasser is currently in private practice in Phoenix, specializing in internal medicine and nuclear cardiology. Ms. Farhan Akara is the president and executive director of Muslim Advocates in Oakland, California, a graduate of Wellesley College and Cornell Law School. She has previously served as counsel to the U.S. Senate Judiciary Committee and has worked as a litigation associate with several prominent Washington, D.C. law firms. Mr. Philip Haney is a former Customs and Border Protection Officer in the Department of Homeland Security. Officer Haney completed several tours at the National Targeting Center near Washington, D.C., and he has won numerous awards and commendations for producing material that led to the identification of hundreds of terrorists. Having retired in July 2015, Mr. Haney now resides in Marietta, Georgia. Mr. Richard Cohen is an attorney and the president of the Southern Poverty Law Center, a graduate of Columbia University and the University of Virginia School of Law. Mr. Cohen has previously testified before the House Committee on Homeland Security and has served on the Department of Homeland Security's Countering Violent Extremism Working Group. Mr. Chris, Chris Galbitz is a businessman, activist, and national security consultant based in Franklin County, Virginia. He has spent nearly a decade researching the threat to America posed by radical Islamic terrorism and developing expertise on the network of public and private organizations that terror groups rely on for support. Mr. Michael Gurman is a fellow with the Liberty and National Security Program at the Brenner, Brennan Center for Justice at New York University Law School. A graduate of Wake Forest University and Northwestern University Law School, Mr. Gurman previously worked as a special agent of the FBI. He has taught at the National Defense University, the John Jay College of Criminal Justice, and spent several years with the American Civil Liberties Union's Washington Legislative Office. And Mr. Andrew McCarthy is a senior fellow at the National Review Institute and a contributing editor to National Review. A graduate of Columbia and the New York Law School, Mr. McCarthy served as a federal prosecutor for 18 years in the United States Attorney's Office for the Southern District of New York. 
He was the lead prosecutor in the terrorism case against the so-called Blind Sheik and 11 others convicted in 1995 of conspiring to wage a war of urban terrorism against the United States. Mr. McCarthy is the author of several books on terrorism and national security. And I would ask that each of you stand and raise your right hand. Do you affirm that the testimony you are about to give before the committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? You may be seated, and you are each sworn in. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, thank you very much for the opportunity to testify here today. Also, I'd like to express my appreciation for the patience of the members on the committee and Senator Coons while obtaining a copy of my written testimony. I'd like to start with a visual aid. This is the Homeland Security Advisory Council Countering Violent Extremism Subcommittee Interim Report for 2016. My colleague referred to it earlier as a, a, a suggesting that we should refrain from using words like umma or jihad or sharia. I would like to also show you another visual aid, and this is what is called the Words Matter Memo that was published in January of 2008. And my story today is going to be what happened between these two documents, these two touchstone documents, 2008, and 2016, because it was during that period of time that what we know now as the countering violent extremism policy came to be. And one of the expressions of that policy is what we heard all about in the media in, in a few days after the Orlando shootings, that R Attorney General Lynch was going to release partial transcript of Orlando 911 calls with all references to Islamic terrorism removed. That is a con condensation of what was actually happening behind the scenes with subject matter experts like myself who were sworn officers to protect our country from threat, both foreign and domestic. Between these two dates, 2008 and 2016, came what I call the first great purge. When I was ordered by the Department of Homeland Security headquarters to modify a euphemism, removing all linking information out of approximately 820 text subject records in our law enforcement system that almost exclusively had to do with Muslim Brotherhood Network here in the United States. I was told to remove all unauthorized references to terrorism, that I was no longer allowed to do what are called memorandums of information received, what we call MOIRs, no more text records, no more research, and no more special treatment from the agency. But during that time, hundreds of law enforcement actions had been taken in the three-year period when those 820-plus records were still in the law enforcement system, system. At exactly the same time, a controversial inaugural meeting took place on January 20. 27th and 28th, 2010, between American Muslim leaders and the Department of Homeland Security Secretary Janet Napolitano, which was hosted by the Department of Homeland Security Civil Rights and Civil Liberties. It was controversial because several of the individuals attended the invitation only conference in DC were known affiliates of at least two of the same Muslim Brotherhood front groups that had just been named as unindicted co-conspirators in the largest terrorism trial in the history of the United States, the Holy Land Foundation trial. Also that spring, at least six individuals with known affiliations to the Muslim Brotherhood front groups were appointed to the Countering Violent Extremism CVE Working Group, which was convened under the authority of the Homeland Security Advisory Council. I would like to show you now the logo of the Muslim Brotherhood, the moderate organization that this administration chose to ally itself with. Across the middle, it says Al-Iqwan Al-Muslimin, which means the brothers of the Muslim or the Muslim Brotherhood. And at the bottom, taken from Quran 860, is the word Wayayuda, which means prepare yourselves to terrify your adversaries with steeds of war or weapons of war. That is the motto of the Muslim Brotherhood. By the spring of 2010, we had come to the point that a CBP officer was literally moving, linking information, meaning the dots, on Muslim Brotherhood-linked individuals from text while the administration was bringing the very same individuals into positions of influence to help create and implement our counterterrorism policy, both in the domestic arena 
and in the foreign policy arena as evidenced in our overt support of the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, Libya, Algeria, and Syria. Fast forward to August 30, 2011, when the Tablighi Jamaat court uh, case that I worked on was approved by the Chief Counsel of Department of Homeland Security. And this is an icon of the Tablighi Jamaat movement, one of the largest in the world outside of the United States. It's called the Army of Darkness. I began a TDY assignment needing temporary duty at the National Targeting Center in November of 2011. Within six months, we had instituted 1,200 law enforcement actions on the case that we had started. But in September of 2012, what I call the second great purge, when the administration removed 67 linking records out of that case that had direct ties to both to the San Bernardino Mosque, Darulum al Islamiyah San Bernardino, and the Islamic Center of Fort Pierce down in Florida. In other words, the network that we had worked on at NTC is tied directly to the terrorist attacks that we've seen recently. At the end of my career, I was relieved of my service weapon. All access to texts was cut off and suspended. My secret clearance was revoked, and I was sequestered for 11 months while the, re while the results of three simultaneous investigations from three different branches of the government were concluded. In July of 31 of last year, I retired honorably. In conclusion, the threat of Islamic terrorism does not just come from a network of armed organizations such as Hamas and ISIS who are operating over there somewhere in the Middle East. In fact, branches of the same global network have been established here in America, and they are operating in plain sight, especially among those of us who have been charged with the duty of protecting our country from threats both foreign and domestic. The goal, meaning the strategy of the global Islamic movement, is based on Quran 2, 191 through 193, and is actually quite simple, to establish Sharia law everywhere in the world, including here in America. And there is an organization in the United States that's actively doing that. It's called the Assembly of Muslim Jurists of America. Very benign sounding name, but in Arabic it is Majama Fukaha al Sharia bi Amrikiya the group of lawyers implementing Sharia law in the United States, which is unconstitutional. The threat that we face today that continues growing despite the willful blindness of those who insist on pretending otherwise are not the tactical methods of violent extremism, terrorism, or even operative verbs such as jihad, but rather the historical and universally recognized Islamic strategic goal of implementing Sharia law everywhere in the world so that no other form of government, including the United States Constitution, is able to oppose its influence over the lives of those who must either submit to its authority, become second-class demi-citizens, or perish. Thank you very much for uh, your attention. I'm a national security consultant with a company called Understanding the Threat, or UTT. UTT is the only organization in America which trains law enforcement, intelligence professionals, military and leaders on the threat from the global Islamic movement, the doctrine of jihadi groups, and how to identify, investigate, and dismantle them. At UTT, we hold the firm belief that in order to defeat the global Islamic movement, we must understand the enemy. U.S. military warfighting doctrine, specifically the intelligence pre preparation of the battlefield manual, states that war planners must begin all analysis of the enemy with who the enemy says they are and why they are fighting us. That becomes the basis for determining the enemy threat doctrine, which in the case of jihadis is Sharia. Universally, the enemy, jihadis, whether it's Al-Qaeda, ISIS, the Muslim Brotherhood, they all state that they are Muslims waging jihad in the cause of Allah to establish an Islamic state under Sharia. I'm going to discuss one jihadi group, the Muslim Brotherhood. Based on evidence entered into the largest terrorism financing and Hamas trial ever successfully prosecuted in U.S. history, and my own experience conducting undercover research with Hamas doing business as care, the Council on American Islamic Relations. The Holy Land Foundation trial was adjudicated in Dallas, Texas in 2008 and identified CARE as a member of the Muslim Brotherhood or the U.S. Muslim Brotherhood's Palestine Committee, which is Hamas, a designated foreign terrorist organization. The U.S. government identified Hamas as an outgrowth of the Muslim Brotherhood. 
Documents entered into evidence in the Holy Land Foundation trial also revealed that ISNA, the Islamic Society of North America, is a Muslim Brotherhood organization which financially supports Hamas, again, a designated terrorist organization. At the time it was indicted, the Holy Land Foundation was the largest Islamic charity in the United States and was convicted on 108 counts for funneling over $12 million to a foreign, ter foreign terrorist organization, which Hamas, which is the Palestinian branch of the Muslim Brotherhood. The Muslim Brotherhood creed states, quote, Allah is our goal, the Prophet is our guide, the Quran is our constitution, jihad is our way, and death for the glory of Allah is our greatest inspiration or ambition. The Muslim Brotherhood bylaws state, the Islamic nation must be fully prepared to fight the tyrants and the enemies of Allah as a prelude to establishing the Islamic state. Again, the Muslim Brotherhood agenda is no different than that of Al-Qaeda or ISIS. The Muslim Brotherhood logo, as Mr. Haney showed, has two swords cradling a Quran with a reference to ayah or verse 860 of the Quran, which states, against them make ready your strength to the utmost of your power, including steeds of war, to strike terror into the hearts of the enemies of Allah and your enemies. This verse is also referenced in the Al-Qaeda training manual which was discovered in May 2000 by British investigators conducting a search of Al-Qaeda operative in Asalibi. Now, during my time conducting undercover research as an intern for Hamas, both at CARE in Maryland, Virginia, and Herndon, Virginia, and CARE National in Washington, D.C., I preserved documents that revealed Hamas doing business as CARE, conspired to cover up fraud committed by one of their immigration attorneys, discussed coordinating with bin Laden and his associates, placed staffers and interns inside congressional offices, conspired to influence Congress, specifically judiciary, intelligence, and homeland security committees, impacted congressional disti districts, tasking each Hamas chapter office with influencing at least two legislators, and ordering books from the Saudi embassy on the virtue of jihad and martyrdom. worked with a Muslim law enforcement officer to influence a major terrorism investigation by accessing a classified federal police database and tipping off the suspect. And the current administration and the U.S. national security apparatus continues to use leaders of Muslim Brotherhood groups like ISNA, the Muslim Public Affairs Council, CARE, and others to provide direct input into American foreign policy and domestic counterterrorism strategies. One of the results of this situation is to order the removal of terms like jihad and sharia from our counterterrorism lexicon. I attended a convention in Columbus, Ohio in 2008 organized by Muslim Brotherhood Group ISNA and both the Department of Homeland Security and the Department of Justice Federal Bureau of Prisons had recruitment and outreach booths. Both Congressman Keith Ellison and Andre Carson spoke at the Muslim Brotherhood event and I witnessed Imam Siraj Wahaj, who is a vocal advocate for the implementation of Sharia and an unindicted co-conspirator in the 1993 World Trade Center bombing, solicit donations for Hamas at CARE's annual banquet. Siraj Wahaj was the first Imam to offer prayers in Congress. Often when understanding the threat offers training to federal, state, and local law enforcement, Muslim Brotherhood groups work to intimidate the hosts of the uh, training venues into canceling the training by threatening them with ties or with cries of Islamophobia and racism. Documents entered into the evidence into the Holy Land Foundation trial entitled an explanatory memorandum outlined the role of the Muslim Brotherhood in North America. Quote, the, the process of settlement is a civilization jihadist process with all the word means. The Ikhwan must understand that their work in America is a kind of grand jihad in eliminating and destroying Western civilization from within and sabotaging its miserable house by their hands and the hands of the believers so that it is eliminated and God's religion is made victorious over all other religions. According to our enemy, the global Islamic movement, made up of many groups including Al-Qaeda, ISIS, the Muslim Brotherhood, Tabliki Jamaat, Boko Haram, Hamas, Hezbollah, and many nation states, including Pakistan, Iran, Saudi Arabia, and many others, they all seek to impose Sharia. It is the, the blueprint from which they create their warfighting strategies. From a U.S. warfighting 
perspective, that naturally makes Sharia the enemy threat doctrine and adherence to Sharia a direct threat to the Republic. Until American leaders and national security professionals identify the threat and formulate policies and strategies that address adherence to this ideology, we will continue on our current path of defeat and eventually lose this war here at home as we did in Iraq and Afghanistan. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. McCarthy. Thank you, Chairman Cruz, members of the committee. Thank you for inviting me to testify today. As my submitted testimony summarizes, I worked on terrorism investigations, trials, and changes in counterterrorism law in various capacities over the years. It taught me that there were very much two sides to this story. The first Muslims I met in our investigation after the 1993 World Trade Center bombing were not terrorists. Uh, they were Muslims who were seized with a pa patriotic fervor for the United States, without whom we could not have infiltrated terror cells and stopped a, a massive murder attack, uh, the plot on the New York City landmarks, which would have killed thousands of people. In my second career as a writer in 2008, I penned a, uh, an account of my experiences entitled Willful Blindness, a Memoir of the Jihad. The title is obviously a double entendre. My principal defendant, Omar Abdul Rahman, is a blind and willful exponent of Sharia supremacist ideology. Our government's response to the threat he represents has been and continues to be willfully blind to this ideology, the belief system that catalyzes the threat against us. To grasp this dangerous phenomenon, we need only consider the blind sheikh himself. After the World Trade Center bombing, our government represented to the American people, just as it does today, that the terrorist attack executed by Muslims in express reliance on Islamic scripture was a wanton act unrepresentative of any mainstream of Islamic thought. But think about the blind sheikh. He was not merely blind, he was beset by several other medical handicaps. Terrorism is hard work. Yet here was a man who was the unquestioned leader of a terror cell who seemed utterly incapable of doing anything that would be helpful to a terrorist organization. He couldn't build a bomb, he couldn't hijack a plane, he couldn't carry out an assassination. All he could do was command murder. How could that be? The answer was straightforward, though it was plainly not one that we wanted to hear and still one that we do not want to hear. The Blind Sheikh is a doctor of Islamic jurisprudence graduated from Al-Azhar University in Cairo, the seat of Sunni Islamic learning for over a millennium. His area of expertise is Sharia, Islam's legal code and societal framework. The jihadists who listened to him did so because he is an internationally recognized authority in Islamic scripture, specifically of the political ideology drawn from that scripture that inspires attacks against the West. The centrality of ideology tells us why terrorists obeyed the blind sheikh. It tells us why terrorists act, something that we must grasp if we have any hope of defending ourselves and defeating them. Yet, instead of focusing on this ideology, we have wasted much of the last two decades on a fool's errand, attempting to define a true Islam in the futile help, hope of discrediting terrorists as purveyors of a false Islam. The stubborn fact is there may not be a true Islam. Islam has a rich and diverse history, and there are various interpretations of it, all vying for the mantle of true Islam and denying it to one another. Innumerable factions of Muslims have been debating one another, often violently, for 14 centuries. They have not settled the question, what is the true Islam? The United States is not going to settle it either. From the standpoint of American national security, it is irrelevant whether there is a true Islam. What matters is that there is a Sharia supremacist construction of Islam to which hundreds of millions of Muslims have adhered for centuries. They are su uh, supported by centuries of scholarship and scriptural literalism, and we are not going to convince them that they are wrong. Sharia supremacism, their interpretation of Islam, uh, is less a religion as we understand it as it is a political radicalism with a religious veneer. It is virulently anti-Western, misogynist, anti-Semitic, homophobic. 
It rejects basic tenets of Western liberalism, including the power of people to chart their own destiny and make laws in contravention of Sharia. It rejects individual liberty and equality. It brooks no separation between spiritual life and civil society. It endorses violent jihad to implement and spread Sharia. And it regards the United States, closely trailed by Israel and Europe, as the principal enemies to, of Islam who must be defeated. This is something we desperately need to understand and highlight, not obscure and avoid. There has been a reluctance to do this, and this is not a partisan issue. Government counterterrorism policy has been willfully blind for a quarter century to the ideological underpinnings of radical Islamic terrorism. The reluctance has been uh, rationalized on the wayward theory that because a person's religious beliefs and political speech are constitutionally shielded from prosecution, they are similarly shielded from mere inquiry and investigation, notwithstanding that we know these are often the precursors to violence. A sensible national security policy cannot regard evidence as if it were hate speech. There is nothing inherently wrong with, much less constitutionally offensive about, the concept that radical religious beliefs or political beliefs should trigger investigations. That is especially the case if those beliefs are conveyed by aggressive language or by association with other radicals or mosques known to endorse jihadism. Here is an important principle we must get right. It cannot be that evidence an investigator may use to prove guilt of terrorism offenses is somehow insulated from an investigator's suspicions about potential terrorism offenses. The goal of counterterrorism is supposed to be the prevention of jihadist attacks, not the hope that there may be a living terrorist or two still around to be indicted and tried only after Americans have been murdered. In 1996, I was awarded the Justice Department's highest honor for proving the nexus between jihadist commands in Islamic scripture, their exploitation by Sharia jurists like the blind sheikh, and the commission of jihadist atrocities by young Muslims that he inflamed. Today, to say aloud what the Clinton administration honored me for 20 years ago is to be ostracized as an Islamophobic bigot. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, that is no way to protect our country. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McCarthy, and I'd like to thank each of the witnesses for your testimony today. I want to begin my questioning with Mr. Haney. And I would note, Mr. Haney, that I think your testimony before this subcommittee today is, is exceptionally important. And I would commend both members of the media and members of the American public to examine your testimony closely because you have described a systematic policy, uh, indeed, of scrubbing, sanitizing, erasing references to radical Islam. Uh, indeed, you described in your oral testimony that as the, quote, first great purge, where 876 documents were edited by the FBI to remove references to radical Islamic terrorism. And, and am I understanding your testimony cor correctly that the administration has been systematically scrubbing law enforcement and intelligence materials to remove references to radical Islam? Yes, it happened a year after the Holy Land Foundation trial when it was proven in federal court irrefutably that these networks were tied to financial support of Hamas. The 800 and plus records that I was ordered to modify, removing all the linking information out of the system called TEX, were virtually all linked directly to the Muslim Brotherhood network of individuals and organizations established right here in the United States. And Mr. Haney, I want to draw your attention to the following chart that compares the 9-11 Commission report which had 126 references to, to jihad, 145 references to the word Muslim, and 322 references to Islam. Now, if we fast forward to the FBI counterterrorism lexicon, we see the relevant numbers are zero, zero, and zero. Suddenly, jihad, Muslim, and Islam have disappeared. They have likewise disappeared from the National Intelligence Strategy in 2009, 
zero, zero, and zero. From the strategic implementation plan to prevent violent extremism, zero, one, one slipped in apparently, zero. And finally, the National Intelligence Strategy 2014. Is this pattern of Orwellian editing of law enforcement and national security materials consistent with your experience and what you observed helping protect this nation? Yes, the first great purge I referred to was in 2009, but that wasn't the last one. There was another great purge in 2012 when they didn't just modify the records, they completely eliminated them out of the system, which com bypasses the security protocol for the Department of Homeland Security. And uh, it may not have mattered except for one tragic c consequence. The masjid in San Bernardino and the one in Fort Pierce were directly related to the case of those 67 records that were deleted out of the system. Mr. Haney, would you elaborate on, on how potentially focusing on this threat might have helped prevent the San Bernardino terrorist attack or the Orlando terrorist attack? The networks are made up of individuals and organizations. In individuals don't exist without a network of organizations. You have to look at both of them. That's why there's no such thing as a lone wolf terrorist, because they don't function in a vacuum outside the, the, the uh, structure of the community, just like planets don't rotate around the sun without the gravitational force to hold them in place. So to look at these acts as separate from the community is a, is a flaw, because we're looking, first of all, at tactics not strategy. The strategy is implementation of Sharia law. If we only look on tactics, they are kaleidoscopic and they will change constantly and we can never acquire a target. If we understand that the underlying strategy of the global Islamic movement, then we understand why these organizations exist in the first place. And then we understand why the people that go there are going to be affected by that gravitational force, if you will, and orbit their lives around that central structure. That's why the mosque in Fort Pierce is called Islamic Center, because it provides a center to their life.